Hi, welcome to Project Matrilineal's podcast series. On this episode, we'll be having Dr. Jaquita Shea Johnson, who is a citizen of the Cherokee Nation and an assistant professor at the University of Missouri-Columbia in the Department of English and School of Visual Studies Digital Storytelling Program. I hope you enjoy. Good afternoon, Professor Shea Johnson. It's, a re it's really a pleasure to have you join us today on Project Matrilineal's podcast series. Thanks for um, inviting me. I'm really happy to be here with you. Yeah, I mean, you have such a rich background um, in rhetoric and composition, indigenous studies, digital storytelling, food studies and environmental humanities, and especially being a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Um, so it's great to have you. I know being part Native American myself, I'm really, really excited to bring your insider perspectives to the audience today. I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> I know that was a very short introduction and probably didn't really do you justice at all um, to the different aspects of your backgrounds. Uh, would you be able to share a little bit more with us? Certainly. Um, as you mentioned, my name's Jaquita Shea Johnson. I'm a citizen of the Cherokee Nation, as you mentioned, um, and I'm also a professor of English and digital storytelling in the School of Visual Studies um, at the University of Missouri, Columbia. Um, so I do a lot of work around um, different types of media, different types of rhetorics. I'm really interested in the ways that we make meaning through our cultural communities and the things that we make, say, and do. And so I think those are the, the sorts of things that kind of bring us into this conversation. Yeah, that's beautiful. I mean, it's, it's great to know that you have such, I guess, a diverse range of studies in that field. So yeah, thank you so much for the background. Um, you mentioned you are a citizen of the Cherokee um, Nation, so would you be able to share, like, shed some light on, I guess, the culture in general, even like the origins of the tribe? Sure. Um, okay, so I think that that's a pretty big question, so I might break it down into a few smaller parts. Um, you mentioned the origins of the tribe, and since this is the Project Matrilineal podcast, I wanted to um, begin framing our conversation around the matriarchal matrilineal aspects of our yeah. tribe just to sort of speak to that content. Um, the Cherokee tribe has a few different origin stories, but one that I think is particularly relevant here is, um, is our story of the corn mother, Selu. And so um, the story goes that the first corn plant became, um, became the mother of all of us. And she sort of came into existence in response to the first man who was sort of having some bad behavior issues, um, not, not living in the good way. <laughs> and so, um, and so the corn, corn mother came to us, Selu, and she had lots of children. Um, and then her children had, um, were also engaging in bad behavior and it ended up killing her which is very sad. Um, but, but in her loss, um, as she died, she bled and, and sort of like gave her body back to the earth to fertilize the land. And so um, that ensured that her children would, would always have food to eat as more corn grew up in her place. That's so it's beautiful. A, yeah. Beautiful recursive <laughs> story. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think that really like fits into the, to the theme of your podcast here. Um, but aside from that, the Cherokee people, I'm going to give you a really broad, brief overview because we, we have a pretty complex history, <laughs> as most people do, right? Um, so we are a tribe that is from the southeastern portion of the United States, um, and that's, that's one of our origin places. Um, we have other stories about having traveled and gone different places, but the place that we call our homelands is in the Great Smoky Mountains. Um, in the areas where Tennessee, Georgia, North Carolina all sort of converge together. Um, and that is where we lived and came from and, and um, called our home for many, many years or millennia um, or at least centuries, right? Um, and so I know that we have a kind of visible history. The Cherokee are one of the largest tribes in the United States, yeah. Uh, colonially known United States. Um, and so I think our story is a little more visible than most tribes, but mm -hmm. um, 
we, at, along with the Choctaw, Chickasaw Creek, Seminole, and and us, the Cherokee, the five form the five civilized tribes. Yeah. Um, and I say civilized with air quotes, right? So civilized um, was a colonial term applied to us um, as, as part of the assimilation project of the United States, which is a whole historical <laughs> time frame. Um, but somewhere between the American Revolution and the Civil War, so in the eight, mid 1830s and 1840s, um, our tribe, along with these other tribes that are in the civilized tribe category, um, were all removed to um, westward past the Mississippi, um, where we were all placed in um, what is currently the state of Oklahoma. So, and that's actually where I'm joining you from. I am um, currently sitting um, at the side of, at the base of a mountain um, <laughs> <laughs> on my tribe's reservation lands uh, in wow. Oklahoma. So I kind of began our story and, and I'm yeah. um, wrapping it up here where I sit now. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Yeah, um, I'm actually not too familiar with um, that story. I, it's it does draw some similarities though to some other tribes that I'm familiar with. Fascinating to see how all these different indigenous tribes connect in some sort of way. Um, you mentioned um, the corn mother earlier and how you know her story was about providing for the tribe and the people. Um, and I know Cherokee culture is very connected to the land, um, especially with that sacred, intimate relationship between the two. Would you mind sharing more on this and kind of, I guess, how it shapes the the way that the Cherokee society was structured? Sure. I think the best way to, to go about that question is is to sort of go back, uh, to kind of go backwards. Yeah. So in telling a little bit of that history, um, I think that also describes some of our connection to the land. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm going to go back a little bit to before the removal um, and when our tribe was based in the Cherokee homelands in the Great Smoky Mountains region. Um, so way back then, <laughs> Before the mid 1800s, the tribe was um, the tribe was sort of fractioned out into smaller townships um, mm -hmm. that were nestled amongst the Smoky Mountains, and it, it's actually taken me a little while to understand what that means fully, um, having visited there a few times. Um, the towns were kind of like mini tribes in in and of themselves. They were um, they had their own like representatives and each tribe or each township had had sort of their own chief. Um, and so they had leaders that worked together in a larger council to form the great Cherokee nation as a whole. But um, they were also fractioned off into smaller areas together with sort of their own ecosystems, their own languages, their own and, and sort of their own distinct practices. Um, and, and I'm going to back up. I misspoke when I said languages. Um, they just sort of had their own dialects of the language. So some of the tribes spoke sort of different regional dialects, you know, um, but they could still communicate um, yeah. uh, with the larger group. But they just sort of had their own accents and their own sorts of like uh, phrases and things like that due to the geographical separation uh, with the mountains. And so um, our tribe is really sort of rooted in place in a very particular way. Um, and so we had um, different, the ways that the, the land um, was integrated into our tribal communities were tied to like relationships with the land and not yeah. just like what we could get from the land, but working right. in collaboration with the land, building connections. Um, and so we had places where we gathered salt. We had places where we um, found different types of um foods right specific mm -hmm. foods had different places in different times and seasons yeah. and things like that so back then people lived very um closely with the land and in relationship to it and not in an extractive way like we tend to right to view in the you know modern day yeah wow that's amazing i mean yeah you're right a lot of that we don't see much of that today do we we it's it's really. more so now like how can we exploit the land um to serve ourselves rather than have that mutual relationship between the land and 
our communities. Um, yeah. So yeah. just kind of more on that. Is there anything that you would say that we can learn, I guess, from the intersection of the culture and the environment? I know you've done a lot of extensive work on that end. Sure. So most of my work um, in that area primarily has been rooted around a type of mushroom. Um, mm -hmm. That is one of our one of our delicacy foods, and and they're called in um, in mainstream culture they're called hen of the woods mushrooms, um, and their uh, Latin name is Grafula frondosa. Um, but th they're also called maitake in in Japanese culture. So mm -hmm. um, most people might know them by hen of the woods or maitake, but we Cherokee people call them wishi, and it, it's really from the Cherokee word do wish. Um, which means, which is just our word for that type of mushroom. Diwoli yeah. is our, our term for mushrooms as a whole, but duish is for that one type. Um, so we call it wishy, um, and it's a type of mushroom that we have a lot of, that we like place a lot of importance on. It was one of those foods that kept us from starving when times were tough, and it was also one of those foods that is very nourishing and has a lot of health benefits, um, as we're seeing in current studies coming from Japan around the my, use of maitake to treat things like cancer and to treat yeah. um, other types of diseases. So it's kind of one of those things where science is really affirming the thing that we already knew um, yeah. for a long time. But um, so one of the things that I think speaks to this connection is that um, in my research I've learned, and, and I also knew it from my own everyday experience, um, that even still as we, we gather this mushroom, we're expected to act in relation with the land. So when we gather this mushroom, we mark it, we, we act as stewards to it rather than just mm -hmm. take it when we right. see it, you know, out in the wild. Um, instead, we like make, we pay attention to where it is. We pay attention to how big it is, how developed it is, if it needs to wait a little bit longer before we take it to let it mature rather than just you know, mm -hmm. grab the whole thing. Um, we place, we say prayers when we take it. We ought, we give offerings to the land when we, when we take the mushroom so that it will grow back. And so that, and, and as our way of showing respect for being able to take that mushroom with us. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think like those little practices are good examples of what that can look like. Yeah. There's real consideration there for the land and what it can give you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's beautiful. Um, what we give in return as well. Yeah. What would you say, I guess, on that, to, at that, on that topic, um, the most important thing that we can do to give back to the land? I know you mentioned like taking care of it and being considerate of it, but with all it gives us, what would you say the most important thing now in present, present day society when, you know, we see so much exploitation? How would you say that we might reform our practices today? That's a really big question. I'm excited to answer it. I think there are a lot of different ways that, that can look. Um, there's this one book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Yeah. And it's a pretty famous book. It's be it's becoming really popular. Um, but she says this one thing in it that always strikes me as really important, that she can't wait for the day that the, that the land gives back and thanks us in return. So... Um, right now we're just forcefully extracting, right? We see it with, with the oil industry. We see it with, um, agriculture, big agriculture, where it's stripping the land of, of its natural foliage and plant life. And instead, um, establishing like large scale farms, things like yeah. that. And in doing so creating a lot of ecological harm. And so I think the things that we can do, um, best as individual citizens is both to try to push back against that in whatever ways we can. Um, and we saw that a lot with Standing Rock and the Standing Rock protests that were so meaningful. Yeah. That was the thing that made it so important, right? It's that not only is the land at stake, but the communities and the people are at stake too, and the waterways and all those sorts of things. Yeah. So um, beginning to think about the little ways that we can um be stewards and good stewards to the land on our own small scale, which, uh, which would be like, um, uh, e easy, simple things like planting native grasses instead of like Bermuda mm -hmm. grass and the, those types of things in our yards doing, 
doing ecological landscaping and just trying to become more um, better plant relatives and plant stewards, as well as like the large scale direct action resistance to those larger extractive forces. So I think it's a larger consorted effort that's bigger than all of us, but takes all of us at the same time. Yeah, it's really important for us to come together in this effort because I don't I don't think anything is something that you can do on your own, especially something this big. <laughs> <laughs>